reiterate this <laughs> kind of um, frame. Um, and maybe we can start by, <clears throat> maybe you can tell us a little bit about your, um, your visits in, in Michoacan. Yes, sure. Uh, do you hear me well? I do, yeah. It's a bit stuck here. <clears throat> uh -huh. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I should give a bit of a context of the state of Michoacán. Mexico City is a republic and it's divided in 32 states now. And <clears throat> Michoacán is about, I mean, it's about two hours, three hours from the city driving. Uh, but the, the way, the place I went is, is about five hours. So it's kind of not really far away. It's not like going to the north or to the south, but still in the central part of Mexico. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a, it's a place that I haven't visited actually uh, before since maybe more than 10 years. And <clears throat> I have to say this because I think one of the interesting things about uh, this visit for me was that uh, we stop Mex in Mexico City. Most of us stop visiting the countryside uh, since more or less 2006, 2008, because it's when it started the drug and wars, uh, the war on drugs, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so in a way, going there was like breaking some kind of uh, taboo or some kind of fear, I would say that somehow we have grown citizens in, in the last, uh, yeah, almost decade. Uh, also because uh, the thing with Michoacan is, is that it was one of the main, uh, yeah, states where, where the conflict was happening. <clears throat> Part of this conflict is the, is the situation with Cheran. Uh, Cheran, uh, is part of, of, of an Indian, of the town that, that configured uh, an Indian community uh, called the Purepecha community. So it's, it's in, in a plain, kind of in the middle of the state. And what happened there is that it's, it's, it's a town that, that lives from a harvesting forest, you know, it lives from a forest. So what happened is that slowly through a couple of years, uh, mafia groups started to plunder or cut the trees and they started, let's say, to basically appropriate uh, the forests surrounding the town. So that's, that's what provoked this kind of uh, rebellion because there was a moment where they could not stand it anymore. And in the morning, uh, the women of the town, they, they got together and they conspired to stop this, uh, yeah, these people, and they basically stopped the caravan of cars uh, that was, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that was stealing the trees, uh, leading to a rebellion. Uh, so when I went there, uh, when I met these people, uh, they, I met the artists from, from the village and they invited me to visit them. Uh, they took me to this forest and basically it's, it's, it's a forest, or let's say it's the park of the village. Uh, what they have done was to take the, the burned um, the burned wagons that resulted from the confrontation, and they placed them in the forest, and so they hang some of the of the wagons. So to me, it was like a very strong experience. It was a very shocking experience, uh, or shocking like in, in a good way. I mean, like uh, it was really. I could feel the, the intensity of, of, of what happened there, or I could really feel, yeah, like, like really I could connect, you know, not just only my imagination to what had happened or what I read about it, but suddenly I, I was in front of, of, yeah, something witnessing. <clears throat> but also it was like a very strange or interesting, or almost like surreal uh, vision to see this, burnt wagons or remains of a war like just been hanging in, in, in the middle of this forest and and I think they in a way semantically they connected very well to things like let's say the source of the problem which was the the, the plundering of the forest the, the, um, 
yeah, the ex extract the way they extracted, let's say, the, the prime matter from there, uh, together <clears throat> with the wagons or, or, or the actual fight. So, so to me, it was really, um, yeah, it really touched me a lot to, to be there. And visiting them, it really like sparked completely. Uh, yeah, it put me to think. It put me to really uh, try to understand what was for me that that experience. Uh, yeah, it, it really created a sort of, of admiration of, of the happening, you know? <clears throat> but also put me to reflect a lot about what is the condition of these artists living there. So, what means in a way to be a, an artist from an indigenous uh, group, you know, or etnia, uh, what means to live as an, uh, to be part of an art, a very small artist community in a very small town that is not connected, let's say, to the city or to the Mexican art world in, in the regular way. And what I discovered was also like a sort of, um, yeah, like besides the difference of who we are and the different way we live, uh, like a sort of very strong and easy, um, like connection, <clears throat> I will say, as artists. So I noticed that we, we will share different interests, that in a certain level, there was not really like a, such a big difference between who we are and where we live and, and you know, culturally where we come from. Uh, but actually, there was like a lot of space in between to, to speak about uh, that they were not, let's say, as artists, not that different as what I am or what a city, uh, city artist will be, you know, like a urbanite. And to me, that was also uh, an important discovery because it was, I realized there, there is a lot of ground to connect. So that really started like a conversation. Uh, I'm collaborating now with a group of younger artists, which are, are, yeah, it's a group that started now with the pandemic and they're also trying things and, and to work socially. So for instance, what we're doing now is to invite the Chilanese artists to come to Mexico City, almost like a sort of reciprocate exchange, like to bring them here. They arrive next Monday. So it's interesting because it's gonna be almost like the opposite. We need to impress them. We need to <laughs> like, show them what we have here. And, and I think it's interesting to me because it also opens up um, different discussions uh, about, you know, that relate to colonialism, that relate to <clears throat> urban versus uh, countryside, you know, uh, mestizos or mixed people as we are versus, for instance, Purépecha people questions of language, questions of, of coming from different traditions, but also about how traditionally, uh, either from the right wing or the left wing or conservative or progressive people refer to, let's say, this kind of other that lives in the country, which in a way also brings into a mirror relationship of perhaps we are the other or, or how we relate in this way. So there are interesting things, for instance, to me, because for instance, um, one of their wishes is to come and see the galleries in Mexico. You know, they're interested to see the galleries. And we will assume that they coming from a, <clears throat> from a village that became autonomous, that has rebelled, that has this kind of very strong heroic past, and that is from the Purépecha uh, culture, you know, like they will be, completely busy with a different system, or they would be not interested at all in commercial art world circuit galleries. But then you realize that they are perfectly aware that they also have a desire to participate in this world, that they're interested. So it's been, for instance, very interesting to collaborate with, with this group of younger artists, which are quite ideologized, and then suddenly enter into these funny discrepancies of what one is expecting of the other or what they expect, for instance, from the Purepech artist to come here and perform. It's a bit like, like something that often happens to me that I travel to another country and especially it happens a lot in the States and I arrive from Mexico and then the first thing they tell me is that they are gonna take me to a Mexican restaurant. You know, <laughs> It's like the last thing I want to do. 
<laughs> I prefer to eat hamburgers or whatever. But it, it, it's like this kind of expectation of you are this other and you're, which in a way you are and you cannot deny it, but there is also like all these other forms of connecting to, to, to other people in general. So for me, that was also uh, quite a lot, uh, the exercise of, of, of writing this text to try to find a different uh, stage of where to stand in front of this other person or this other group of artists. So it became a complicated uh, text to write because even often when you have very good intentions about describing someone else, when you are like, uh, for instance, saying like, I'm gonna write about the Swiss artist and even with the best intentions or being critical, but not even trying to, you know, like even in their favor, you know, like trying to write, you often can end up, or is what I noticed by writing that you can end up sounding patronizing. You can end up sounding um, even with the best intentions. So how to write a text where you avoid that, you know, where you can write about the other, but not only in admiration, you can also be critical, but let's say without entering this kind of well-meant or badly meant unconsciously, uh, uh, yeah, descriptions of who there is. Like you state something, you say like, okay, the repertoire artists are great because their relation with blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and then you realize that, that, you know, you enter very delicate positions. And one of the, the important things is that I went with them for a second time and I uh, told them I was writing a text and that I would like to show them that I would like, you know, they will be the first readers and after that I will be able to publish another text. So that became really like a challenge because I knew they were my first readers. They were, it was about them. They were happy that I was writing the text because there is not a lot of literature yet about what they're doing. So for them, they felt it contribute to what they do. Uh, <clears throat> but in the, in the other hand, they were my first critics. So it was really like, oh my God, like how do I write? Not to please them, because they also say something very good for me, which was like, you, we might agree with what you write. We think it's good that you write. We, we might agree or not with what you write, but you are free to do it. You know, like it's your opinion. So that was really like, a, big help, but in the other hand, I have to put myself in this exercise of how to talk about someone else, how to talk, that is not just your friend or your pal, 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 you know, like it's not just your accomplice, but somebody like you are completely new, uh, meeting you. Uh, so it went through that, <clears throat> then I, I also share with other people, uh, people I consider, uh, good critical minds, like for instance, uh, Ingard, who you know as well, Imar Ingard Emelhans, who is a, a, yeah, a prominent academic here, quite critical, very much into uh, post-colonialist or decolonialist discourse. So, <clears throat> and not with the fact of just having the perfect text and like sanitizing, but just to understand where you are stepping uh, in, let's say wrong positions. But to me, it was very important to find a way to, dis to describe the other, let's say in a more horizontal way. And, I, and the place where I found this was possible was in assuming that we're artists. Uh, anyhow, you know, like from wherever we go or whatever stage in our career is known or known or whatever, we are artists and from that point of, let's say, uh, being colleagues, we can trace a certain, uh, I would say, connection that just there. Uh, so that's the text I, I, I choose. Uh, the text is becoming part of uh, animation. So it's, it's, it's become the narrative voice of, a, of an animation I'm working with, about, uh, with, or of. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> 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 an animation here. <laughs> I'm gonna present it next week in Michoacan, in Pascuaro. Um, so it became a whole paradox because in the text, I, I proposed the curator that, that I will do nothing, you know, that for me, it was enough or it was sufficient or it was really the point of going to Michoacan in the middle of this pandemic. 
was to understand that, you know, to see the place, to meet some people and to admire them or to, the, you know, to dedicate my work to them instead of trying to push my work or say like, this is what I do. Uh, and that Guillermo and me will do nothing, you know, but what is this nothing? So that became really like a big question in the text. I proposed that Guillermo and me will just go there and hang out and do this kind of Rousseau thing of just wandering and thinking and talking together. But then I, I, I realized that I had to be more radical in a sense. So I decided to rebuild the space and to rebuild the, you know, the forest with the, with the cars uh, in 3D. So I did what I normally do, for instance, to, to <clears throat> yeah, when I'm planning an exhibition, I, I use these programs and I build a bit my projection of the show and how I'm planning it. Uh, so I build it like that. So basically we build this mountain, uh, we put trees, we hang burnt cars in it. And then I realized that Guillermo and me are, were more like astronauts. So in a way we were like these complete foreigners, like just arriving there. And so I put two astronauts and it just becomes this kind of oniric or, or strange, really horrible, ugly uh, 3D animation. I also try not to do it, like let's say, in my style or, or to. So I just bought these model figures, you know, like that you use for 3 This is very generic. And I'm using the text as, as a narration, you know, as, as, as an over voice that is just telling you through. And the text is a bit repeating, a bit like the news, you know, like, like when you have this breaking news that you see five images and then they just repeat and repeat and repeat. I mean, there are not five images, it's, it's like a seven minute loop, mm -hmm. but it just keeps repeating. So we're gonna put it now. And I think the paradox is that at the end it became a lot of work. So doing nothing means a lot of work. It means a lot of writing work, editing work, and then, you know, like image making work. So actually we work a lot. So this is not so easy to do nothing as you expect normally. Uh, so that's also gonna be shown next week. So I'm also in the preparation of this. So it's two important things for me uh, evolve from this situation, which is uh, the invitation of the Pura Pacha artists to come to Mexico City. They come for a month. Uh, I try to organize a way that they meet as many people as possible and also from different factions. Also, they would go to Galleria Kurimasuto, which is the gallery I work on. Let's say it's a more commercial venture, uh, more an artist venture, but they also will go to the uh, University Museum, to MUAC, uh, to take part of, of a public program and speak. They are staying in the residency of SOMA, which is, is uh, yeah, like a postgraduate initiative that, like artist initiative that happens in Mexico, it's more like a school. And they will also work in a studio from, a, from it's, it's a place called Obrera Centro that now function with, so it's like an independent space. So it's, let's say it's like completely at a, a different position. So I've, I'm trying to design a program for them where they will go through all sorts of positions, you know, from the radical uh, left wingers to the bourgeois artist uh, circuit, you know, so they meet all these different places because I also think it's important to be generous in that sense and not place them in a particular environment and put them into a faction, but ju it's just for them to choose and see. And, you know, I think that the more they know, and in, I mean, they know about it, but the more they meet these people and, you know, also the, it's a collective, but it's also like made of individual artists. So they all have different things, you know, some are 30 years old and some are like almost 60 years old. So it's also changing. So for instance, the, six, the almost 60 years old people is already established. Uh, this person, I think he has other wishes or other desires. He, he wants a market or he wants to improve his market. And the younger ones, they want to meet people, you know? So they want to, let's say, they're still learning in a different way. So, so I also think this is a, an interesting situation for them. Um, 
and the other is to present the exhibition. In, but I mean, I'm pleased because the the biennial I was originally invited, they never canceled the, the situation. They are also not doing it online, so they are doing it for real. Uh, but <clears throat> but yeah, we're gonna have the most sad opening ever possible. <laughs> so it's just like I think only 10 people will attend the opening. It's like super small. Uh, everybody with a mask, you know, like really, really detached. But still, is placing an, a piece in an exhibition. So that's also an important gesture these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in, in your text, you, you hit a lot of um, big questions or crucial questions. Like one of the, the ones that stuck most of me was this opposition between the useless artist and the usefulness or the uselessness of an artist and the usefulness of the artisan. And when I was reading it, I was like a, a little bit um, unsure if you are kind of making, um, how would you say, a, a stance or a proposal or fighting for the, the autonomy of art in, in, in a time where everybody's talking about activism and engaged art and engage with the social. You also connect that in, um, with, with the current uh, funding system in Mexico where the new president um, since 2018, AMLO, uh, actually demands for a kind of usefulness of the artists and with his slogan, uh, the poor first, uh, all you bourgeois artists are basically uh, not the poor guys, but the, the rich middle class and upper class. So suddenly a whole um, support system for for contemporary artists falls away or is kind of shifted in the sense on one side to say, okay, you need to do useful art or, um, yeah, or kind of you, you use the word like service providers uh, of art. And on the other side, uh, all of the money, or at least that money that remained is basically invested into the Chapultepec uh, project, uh, the park, which uh, Gabriel Orozco is supposed to um, design or create. And I like how you then use, sorry, the, your uh, artists in, in Tehran who basically find a nice middle way. Maybe you can. Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> this, I mean, is of course related to a very local context. So in, in the discussion, I'm talking very much about what's happening in Mexico, but I guess also touches other places or, or there is like a, a wider way to, to approach it. Uh, I mean, I think the, the question there is, 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 yeah, it's like, which is a very long uh, question that has been having, happening for a long time. Like what's the use, usefulness of an artist or if artists should be autonomic in, and in which way, you know, because uh, I mean, it's either you have engaged art or you have, let's say, art about art's sake, which is kind of just busy with, let's say, formal issues. So that's maybe a caricature of how to put it, you know? But I also think has to do not so much with the kind of output that you do as an artist, but also has to do with how you work as an artist or your relationships in, rela in, in, in relation to your work, like, let's say, do you work for a larger agency? So do you work for the state or do you work for certain, let's say private companies or for NGOs or, or do you work out of your own sake? How you deal with that? Uh, I mean, I defend a certain autonomy of the artist in the sense of uh, I like to do the projects I want to do in relation to the logic I'm developing. So in my case, what I found was uh, is some kind of like uh, like system where I'm able to work to sell some of my work and then I can reinvest some of my earnings in doing what I want to do socially, for instance. So I'd rather don't let's say if I if I have a social need, like let's say if I want to to work uh, or to do something with the Purepech artist, I'd rather find the funds myself or I, I'd rather. So, but that's the way I solve it. I don't say that that's that should be it. But 
in the moment there starts this uh, demand, let's say coming really from a powerful uh, institution like the state, uh, that art should be in a way or should not be in that way, I start to become a bit this, yeah, um, uh, I would say suspicious, I start to question it. Uh, I think I'm trying to figure out in the text, what is this relation? Uh, and also I'm, I'm responding to, to a question because uh, I was very involved, let's say, trying to defend this Fonca in this because supposedly was going to disappear. So, and I think it's very beneficial for the artists in general, uh, you know, this system of grants and, and it's a bit like, almost like a, a sort of academy without being called an academy, but it's really like a, a run by artists. So, <clears throat> so maybe you can explain quickly how Fonca works. Is it like, a, if you say it's a grant, you get it for a year or is it for? Yeah, it's a grant, but also, I mean, it's, it, it works in different ways. It's, it's, a, it's a money from the state to support the arts uh, and you have different sections. So one is for, um, for younger artists, so up to 35, you can apply. And that's uh, combined, let's say, with some kind of educative system. So it almost performs a bit like postgraduate for, for artists. So you have you have it for a year and you have three reunions with, with let's say, with your generation and with, a, with some mentors. So it has become very important in the formation of many artists, most of the artists in Mexico, because, I mean, it's not a huge money, but it's a money enough to live a month, you know, so you, you might not produce a lot, but you can live as an artist. But then you have these three day reunions where you meet, um, yeah, you meet your group. And then the interesting thing is that you don't only meet the visual artists, but you also meet the musicians, the theater people, uh, writers. So you meet really the cultural community mm -hmm. and your age, <clears throat> and also some of the mentors. So it really creates like a lot of links. So it creates a lot of possibilities for the future, let's say for collaborating. You know, you might find somebody who's writing incredible text that you connect with and eventually that becomes a collaboration in five years. So it's very good in that sense. Then you have after 35 to, well, you die, you have the national system of creators, which are like larger grants and they are for three years. And those are a bit more, more substantial, but also allow people to live as artists, but also produce. And that's quite interesting. And that's what becomes more like sort of academia. The important thing is that the juries are peer uh, juries, so it's really like uh, peer to peer. So it's really artist to artist. So it becomes a group of artists selecting the new group of artists. And then once you are selected, you, part, you become part of the system and you also become part of other juries. So it really, really becomes a bit of, a, let's say, self-legitimizing artistic academy. It becomes almost like a guild. And of course, it's from the states, and they are functionaries, but they are more there to regulate and you know to to make it happen. But it, it has this kind of certain autonomy. It's not an uh, uh, it's not absolutely autonomous, but it's autonomous in the sense of that the discussions come from artists, uh, so they also evolve the way art is evolving. So in that sense, it's important. And then you have a third part, which is the emerito. So it's like a grant they do to very accomplished people, mostly like very old, older artists. So, you know, some already are like wealthy and some are not, doesn't matter, but it's people who have really accomplished something in their lives. So it's mostly people over 60, sometimes 70, like the big names, uh, which in a way is what uh, holds the whole thing together, you know, like, it's kind of like the biggest award you can get as an artist. <clears throat> and I mean, it's been functioning very good. And in the last years, I mean, it's always controversial, but what is interesting is that brings artists also from all the country together. So you have like a lot of meetings and also from very different social classes. So it's not just about this elite of rich artists, successful, blah, 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 or, the opposite, but it's really bringing people in connection. 
So you have this kind of very one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, like you get to know each other, you get to influence each other. So that's been very good. Uh, but the thing, it, 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 it was a fondo, like a font, like a verse, how do you say it? I don't know the, and it's, it's been changing its status. <clears throat> yeah. So the whole discussion now is that it's becoming, let's say a more formalized kind of thing, but there was a lot of suspicion. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Okay, there were many suspicions and, and it was very paranoid in the moment uh, because a lot of artists we felt that it was going to be stopped. Hello? Yes. It's fine. It's all, all good. good. You have to uh, move your mouth, then we can hear you. There? Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, so, so we form a group of people trying to represent and trying to challenge that and understand what was going on. And I became a bit like the person who was in charge to, to speak with the director. And so I spoke to her and we had a couple of meetings and she posed a very, a very important question, I thought, which was, uh, you know, you have these grants, then you have the pandemic, and suddenly it looks like the, the grants are in danger to disappear. And all the artist community rises and starts to complain and are really angry and makes a big fuss uh, for the money. But she told me like, from the outsider's point of view, let's say outside the art world for the community in general, it just looks like the, grant, the artists are complaining because they're gonna lose their grants. So it just looks like they are you know, like just busy complaining about their money, about their helps, but it's not visible how artists are becoming engaged in the situation we are living now, which is, as you know, like a like a very extraordinary situation. You know, <clears throat> uh, so I thought it was like a very fair question. I thought, okay, uh, I understand. You know, it's not always clear from the outside or for other people what are the dynamics or when we talk about autonomy or when we talk about our freedom or our importance as artists, it's not that clear, you know, it, it makes sense inside of our own discussions. So we need to find a way or it might be helpful or might be healthy even to find a way to show our engagement. And that created like a very, very big discussion in, in the arts here. Uh, and a very difficult discussion, I would say, you know, because the question was very simple. The question is like, how can artists show to the outside world that they are engaged people? That doesn't mean you have to become an activist necessarily. That doesn't mean you have to uh, stop making art and suddenly let go. But you have, how can you do that? And it's a simple question, but it's like a really difficult answer. And especially nowadays when most artists stop making art and start to make activism for the outside it becomes difficult to understand that because it makes sense inside of the art world the radicality of becoming an activism but let's say for the outside they just become more and more normal or they become less and less an artist or what people from the outside think artists are you know like for normal people, artists do paintings or sculptures, and it's just more simple. Their image is Dali or their image is the Warhol, if you want. And then in the very sophisticated this world of the arts, uh, the discussion suddenly brings artists to look more, let's say, like activists or like somebody who's outside of the art world, but in, outside of the art world, that just looks normal. You know, it just looks, they look less artists. Mm -hmm. So it became really like a paradox in that sense, or how to make, how to bring solutions to that. And so, yeah, that's also being part of the background of, let's say, the, the longer discussion into that. Well, and this kind of connects to this, um, let's call it the enlightenment moment in the, in the forest, where, where we have this idea of autonomy, of uselessness. And you, in your text, you quote, um, Peter Sloterdijk, a German uh, philosopher, not quite, I don't know if Irngard totally agrees on him, but uh, yeah. Uh, and over there, you talk about uh, a situation of um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who uh, 
who's here in Switzerland in the lake of Bien, floating in um, in a in a rowing boat and basically how do you say lying on a boat sailing aimlessly on Lake Bien in Switzerland. And maybe as a kind of small um, how do you say media change, I'll uh, read what you wrote or the quote, mm. and maybe we can talk a little bit about this idea of the reverie of the uselessness of um, and how you connect that to to the sculpture park and the autonomy of of the artists um, you were talking about so philosopher jean jacques rousseau reflects on this regard lying on a boat mm. sailing aimlessly on lake bien in switzerland in the fifth walk of his book a reverie of a solitaire um, walker his finding gave rise in the dawn of modernity to romanticism, thus contributing to the formation of the societies in which modern man lives. Sloterdijk writes, on some sunny autumn days, the persecuted author by now settled, da settled down and enchanted by the charm of the quiet island rode out onto the lake. Somewhere far out, he put down the oars and lay down in the boat on his back to indulge in his favorite activity. He surrendered to an inner drifting for which the author used the word reverie. One could also describe this following, this flowing of the soul without clinging to any one topic as an immaterial meditation in the European rather than the Far Eastern sense. Rousseau himself, says that at times he let himself drift for hours, immersed in reveries that had no real object, yet were a thousand times sweeter for him than all the things usually known as the pleasures of life. He often approached a point where he was ready to say, I wish this moment would last forever. In this intentionless drifting, he discovered the pure psychological duration in which the conventional course of time with its memories and anticipations disappears, making room for a flowing succession of now moments, jetzt momenten, uncorrupted by any flaws and undisturbed by any thoughts of absent things. The feeling of tranquility expressed in these lines is not alien to our own times because they convey no less than the first appearance of a concept of existence in which the modern individual enters the scene. The individual at once presents itself as a new subject of freedom, probably for the first time. An experience of freedom was expressed in which the subject of freedom refers exclusively to his felt existence beyond all achievements and obligations and also beyond possible ambitions to be recognized by others. The author does not claim to have been close to God or transported to a third heaven. The subject's first words are ones of self-disclosure. He declares that the subject discovered itself in an ecstasy of being with oneself, by sich sein and that it has nothing else to say. By experiencing the feeling of pure existence, it believes it has acquired a sovereign title of being. For Sloterdijk, the existence of individualistic mass society as they exist in this day and age is amazing because they harbor countless individuals with experience in subjectivity, one could almost say with experience in dissolution or asociality experience of happy unusability. I, um, I wanted to read this because uh, also I, I've been quoting Stotterdijk also in uh, one or two texts where he also talks about this uselessness and he talks about, um, how was it, the where the primal scene of the subject, he revealed himself as an exemplary good for nothing, unworldly and unusable, more happy animal than superhuman, more dreamer than character, more emigrant than do-gooder, more holiday maker than entrepreneur. So the first question would be like, um, how, wh why did you think of this text? How did it come to you? Um, and how would you relate uh, let, let's say yourself as an artist, but also the artists you met in Michoacan to this idea of this um, 
romantic, useless uh, <clears throat> stroller, basically. It came from uh, something uh, from discussing about it with uh, about the text in general and what I was writing about with uh, Enrique. Mm -hmm. Enrique is my is my assistant, and we have this. Hello, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. Must stop hear. here. Hello. We can hear you, but maybe you can't hear us. Okay. Yeah. It came from from. Uh, while I was writing, I start to speak with Enrique. Uh, Enrique is, is my assistant, and we have this kind of ongoing conversation about subjects and things. We, we always talk and, and discuss stuff. So he referred me to to the text, and I found the text very interesting in the sense that he's discussing, let's say, two types of of archiving freedom. So one is like the community freedom. So let's say the uprising and what that means. And basically is, let's say, freeing yourself from a tyranny, which therefore uh, demands a lot of responsibility. It, it, it doesn't make a more freer citizen. And it makes it freer from, let's say, a tyrant or from a foreigner, uh, let's say like from who's banking you. Uh, but also demands a lot of responsibility. And that's what happened in Cheran. You know, they, they free themselves from these mafia groups and from, even from the government, from a corrupt government. <clears throat> but that means that the town has to be very responsible. They have to self-govern. You know, they have to really relate to that. So it's, it's a freedom that is collective, but it's not freeing the individual in that sense. And he compares it to, let's say, the individualistic freedom or the European sense of individualistic freedom, because in that sense, <clears throat> Sloterdijk is very European. No? That's his point of view. He states it in, in the, in the, very clearly in the text. Uh, but that, that idea of freedom has also influenced the arts, <clears throat> let's say, in Western societies. And in Mexico, we connect also to this kind of influence. So it's really part of it. I personally find it difficult to relate to that. I'm, I'm not an artist who is trying to free myself and be myself and just be an individual. I never work like that. I never really <clears throat> understood it that way. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I like the idea of the autonomy of the artist. I like the idea of, uh, of yeah, working through my own desires and things like that. But let's say I'm not trying to create in my works a reverie or a, this kind of feeling, you know? Uh, but, that, but I thought it was interesting in a way to compare and to find relations to these things. And as you said before, like to find also a middle grounds in relation to it. I also, uh, when I went to Michoacan after being, let's say in the lockdown in my studio and in my house like for so long, uh, one of the strong effects that, that I experienced was to be able to walk in the nature or to go outside, to drive. Also, it is really a big place, so I could drive like really long. I could just do this kind of road trip thing and then go to places and walk and, and be in the outside. So I also kind of realized the importance of the outside space. Like suddenly I was thrown into the other side of, of the coin. Let's say I was kind of in the inter interpedi, like in the in the cold, in the outside. <clears throat> and, and that created a sort of a moment of, let's say, self-reflection of, you know, so I was put into writing. I was put not into making more art, but into to a process of, of reflection. So I understood that perhaps, you know, it's, it's important now to, to think about public space in a different way. Uh, to, to use it, you know, to basically, uh, yeah, be able to relate to forests, parks, to nature, to, you know, which is it's not something I'm, I'm, it's not part of my work. I'm very much <laughs> a, a cerebral artist and very much to my own head. And so it's not like I'm an artist who creates things for parks at all, you know, but I suddenly realized that, that this experience was perhaps interesting and that the use of the public space could also be thought of differently, you know. And there is also this huge discussion now because uh, 
a lot of money is being put into this Chapultepec Park, <clears throat> which is a huge park in the center of Mexico City. And it's been taken by an artist, you know, by Gabriel Orozco. It's, it's been his proposal to renovate this place. <clears throat> so that also has stirred a huge discussion, like why an artist is in charge of this, uh, such a big, let's say, uh, public, or public project. And also, uh, those, do we need uh, a park like that? So I also wanted to, in a way, touch upon this, this discussion um, because I, I think it's, it's important. It's, it's, it's a new space, or at least it's new for me in the sense of thinking about it. Um, yeah, you know, it has become problematic nowadays to make exhibitions in art galleries or in inside places or in rooms. Uh, or even just to be always online. So, so yeah, I, I try to connect in that sense, you know. Yeah, I think at this point I would like to try and open the discussion. Otherwise, it's just the two white-haired men talking to each other. Um, so, okay, <laughs> are there about reverie and the discovery of the subject? Are there any questions uh, in the group? Or do we have any questions from Georgiana on the comment side or something? So we won't make the same mistake like the last time, you know, wait for long, wait hours for questions and then um, only come with the questions in the end when we don't have any time. So please. I will, I will try mine. Thank you, Juan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry I came quite late to your introduction. Thank you very much, Carlos. It's very inspiring and uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, I just, um, just going back to the main question you've been addressing uh, along the conversation. And uh, that would be um, this concept of useless um, is uh, from which perspective when you said useless for whom I would open up that question, like from which perspective we define that. And uh, also under which uh, paradigm if we are talking from the Western perspective and so point in between or um, yeah, th those are these two questions. And um, yeah, maybe just uh, a comment because I'm, well, I'm, I'm now also a researcher in curatorial practices, but I have my, my practice as an individual uh, independent artist also. Um, and there is a, a question that comes up all the time um, in relation to also this being in your atelier producing, but also producing mostly objects, but also um, to looking through the window, the rituals of the now, the, where people gather, what's going on, what, how much objects are telling us something in the moments that everything is shaking and we kind of um, need answers or need some directions. So this, um, yeah, I was reading the other day that most of the what's going on in the Western culture deals with this crisis of the individual. And um, and that pretty much is due to the modernity, how modernity singularizes all, all our experience as and now uh, when we go to museums, or we go to art institutions, we kind of uh, in need of more transubjective and more intersubjective experiences. Uh, perhaps that's why performance and other expressions that try to gather people are succeeding more than the individual objects. Um, so yeah, those are kind of reflections, uh, but these two questions were to start up the conversation. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, thank you, Juan. Yeah, I mean, I think in a deep, at the end, I reflect a bit in, more about Mexico in, in this text. <clears throat> and what happened in Mexico is that, I mean, the, <clears throat> let's say the important modernistic art form is muralism. It's like we, it's, that's how art history in a way starts for us. Of, of course, you have older 
uh, colonial period or the Aztecs, but let's say in modernity is, is the, the muralism. And the muralism had like very clearly a function, uh, educative function, you know, it, it was the idea that uh, in a country where there was a, a huge analphabetism and still people were having to be taught to read and write, uh, images will convey, let's say, a lot of uh, important subject matter to them, like basically about a revolution, about what is the people, what's nationality, etc. So we come from there, and I think we have been debating it in the last century, like how you relate to, to yeah, how you relate to, to this demand or to this point of view. Uh, so for instance, you have, you have a group of artists in the 60s, late 50s, 60s, which is called the rupture. So they break with uh, muralism. They, they try to make another kind of art. Uh, so it's been really like this ongoing thing. So we have, let's say, like a long tradition of having to do useful art. So how do you relate to it? Do you want to be part of this or not? I think it's an ongoing discussion. Uh, um, on the other hand, I mean, I think that the, the, this crisis, the today's crisis has, at least for me, it has put like, like also my work in crisis. So for instance, for the first uh, months, I couldn't really work. I, could, I tried, I tried to draw, I tried to make painting, whatever, or a project. <clears throat> and it was very difficult to use my studio for that. So what I ended up doing was writing. I was invited to give a lecture. Uh, well, I ended up doing two things. One was uh, I realized that people will be needing face masks and that a lot of people in, in Mexico City will have to anyway work in the streets because we, half of the economy is informal. <clears throat> so I associated myself to uh, to NGO that works with informal workers. And I created like a little system in my studio with my assistants and the people they know and their families, etc. And also with my gallery and with their collectors to uh, fundraise to produce this face mask. In a moment where also was a huge discussion if they will uh, be useful or not, if people will need them. Now, now everybody thinks we should wear them, but at the moment was not, was really in the beginning. So we end up producing this big, uh, yeah, like a large amount of face masks and uh, giving them to people in the streets, especially for street markets and also for cleaning services, like street cleaning services. So it became like a very useful thing, like uh, not only like to give the face masks themselves, but also to think in, in let's say, structures, like economical structures, where you can also connect very unlikely people, let's say the person who is in the street selling groceries or selling fruits to the collector, you know, like it's completely people that know, normally they don't meet each other, you know, the, the collectors don't go into the street to buy their, or some do perhaps, but they completely think different. So how to structure that or how to propose also like other ways of creating an economy in a moment where it felt the economy was about to collapse. <clears throat> but on the other hand, uh, because I couldn't go, I had to direct the whole thing from my studio. So I couldn't see it, I couldn't be there. I just had to create the links. So the face mask will end up in the street. And because I couldn't see, I asked people to make a picture and send it to me just to have a proof, just to understand what was going on. And the nice thing is that I got 3000 pictures. So suddenly I got really like 3000 pictures of people standing in front of their uh, market stand with with the red mask or cleaning the streets or stuff and then I realized that these 3,000 pictures were forming an image they were creating an image of a moment of a historical moment a, an image of the outside so although I don't know if this is art or is not art at the end an image was created and I thought this this is very interesting and also an image because they were all wearing this red mask that created, let's say, a literary image. So it created something like, let's say, closer to Edgar Allan Poe, like the dance of the red mask. So this was like the, the mask, the mask, the masked mask uh, in red. So I could also think, okay, the, the red masses, the Russian revolution, or, you know, like so it just started to spark ideas in my mind, like uh, motivate, let's say, images. 
<clears throat> so I thought, well, maybe the action itself is not art, but it creates an artistic moment in the sense that proposes a fantasy or an image that can create literary thought. But at the end, <clears throat> what I ended up doing was writing. <clears throat> and then when I went to Michoacan, again, I ended up, what I ended up doing was writing. So I noticed that I ended up writing for six months instead of making art or, you know, like in, the, in like my drawings and stuff. It has changed. Like in the last months, I also came back and I took what I call the Onkawara strategy, which is to do the same every day, like the most boring way, and <laughs> just hang to it, you know, like Onkawara was drawing these dates every day. So now I'm, I'm making these collages in my studio, which allow me to, to just pass time, be there and <clears throat> create an object. And now, and now so, well, I also noticed that you might take different positions in different moments, and, and uh, but this is really like a like a wave, so it's really changing. And you know, like for me, it was very clear uh, when I wrote about being inside, trying to create this image in the outside, that this was a counterpoint, for instance, to the opposite, which was going to the outside to create a personal image. I, I felt okay. This is really a dichotomy, you know. It's like being inside, being in the lock, in the lockdown, and then being outside, you know? So that was very clear. But the problem is that the pandemic just goes on. So now I'm in this third period, which is like, okay, the Onkawara moment, like just produce, be bored, you know, like, but I also don't know how, if, if there is gonna be a fourth period or a fifth period, or, or maybe not, maybe you just get sick and die. So it's really this kind of very strange moment. So I think it's very hard to make conclusions in that sense, to say like art should be this or should be that. I mean, you can ideally think about it, but also in my experience, two months later, you are already challenging that situation. So for instance, in the text that I gave you, I, I let's say, advocate for public space, for the use of parks, for the use of forests, for, hey, come on, let's be artists and, and work outside. <clears throat> but maybe perhaps in, in, in two months, that doesn't make sense anymore. So I think that that way is like a very slippery moment. So I think it's interesting to think about it in, in that sense, because we, get, we I sometimes think about, about it a bit like a, in an analogy of how internet start to appear in society. And for instance, in the nineties, internet was like the new thing. And there was like a lot of utopia about it. And a lot of artists started to make works online and like really think as a of internet as a free space as a you know there are a lot of examples from that period <clears throat> which when you think about them today they they are they're so naive you know they are so utopian so completely you know like different from what it became and i feel it's a bit the same here like when the pandemic started we start to think like okay maybe we can live the art world in a different way <clears throat> maybe we don't need institutions anymore Maybe art should be blah, 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 blah. But then six months later, we're completely in a different shock or, or but I think it's interesting. I, I'm not complaining. I, I'm not saying this is wrong or anything, but it's just like really like a motor of, of thought in, in, in a sense. Thank you very much. Um, we are again at this point where I have to use my authority as course leader to say that the time's up, but maybe we can have one last question because we've been breaking the rule uh, constantly. Uh, is there somebody around with a quick question that can result in a quick answer as usual? Quick question. <laughs> <laughs> Colette looks like she would like to say something. I don't know, there are a few things I was thinking when I was reading this text. I really enjoyed it. And um, one thing that I was thinking was, do you think we need to like, ex is there a kind of collective need to expand the parameters of what utility means? Kind of encompass more? I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, collective need, yeah, I guess so. It, I think it depends very much what's the definition of art and how you define it as inside the art world or let's say as a member or as a part of it either as a curator, as an artist, as a museum director, whatever, all the roles that are there. And, but how it's also seen from the outside, 
like what's expected, what's expected from an artist. Uh, and I think there is a discrepancy there. There is like almost like a non-communication. So what we think should be useful inside the art world to the outside world, it might differ very strongly from what, let's say, outsiders would like to have from the art world, you know? Like, so it's almost like the paradox of painting. Oh, I got we can, we can hear you. Ah, okay. can hear you, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think it depends on that a lot. Like, you know, like when I take the taxi or when I used to take the taxi because I don't take it anymore. But somebody asked me like, the taxi driver like, so what do you do, mister? And I'm like, I'm an artist. So they imagine like a painting, you know, like they see this colorful thing, either abstract or realistic. And so you have like, how you explain somebody what you do when it has become complex and sophisticated. And also when, let's say, if my project is to become a taxi driver and that's, let's say in the art world, like, wow, how radical, this is amazing. He's discussing Uber and Uber is such a neoliberal, blah, blah, blah. And it comes this whole discussion and you even get the show where you show the documentation in, where, while you were at Uber driver. But how can you explain that to a real Uber driver and say like you're an artist when for him that his reality is another one. So that's, I think it's a problem of realism and representation. Like the more realistic we become supposedly, the less artistic we become, but still we're representing something. The, so there is a kind of drop or disconnection, but I, I think has to, I mean, it's something I'm thinking a lot about, like what's the, yeah, like this, how this new take in realism is sometimes missing illusion and, re, and reality, you know, like so how sometimes we make sense in our own world, in the art world, but actually outside we stop making sense because we are approaching so much reality that we lose or standpoint or something. So I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to be definite about it, but I, I keep thinking about that. So I think that depends very much either if you are inside the art world or outside of the art world, this notion of, of uh, usefulness. There is a question that is posted on the um, uh, live stream and uh, now is it my time to use uh, a little bit the idea of breaking the rules, which relates a lot, Carlos, to what you uh, just said. And uh, Linda asks us, um, or you, what, um, how you view the art world today and where do you draw the limits of where it starts and ends this world? As an interdisciplinary artist, how do you relate to this world and is it liquid or solid? <laughs> I mean, my, my, when I began as an artist, what I was very interested was to try to make art outside of the art world. So that's how I entered not the, the wrestling world. So I created this fictional persona as a wrestler that I wanted to happen or appear outside. But that create, creates this paradox, you know, where it's, it's almost like thinking of the ready-made, you know, like the ready-made is bringing like a, a normal useful object into the art world and declaring it art. So because enters the context of the art world, it just becomes part of the discourse of the art world. But can you do the opposite? What happened when you bring, let's say, an artistic idea or an artistic piece outside, can it still be considered? Or can it form part of culture, you know, like slowly, like let's say how Andy Warhol eventually becomes part of a rec influence a record cover and then influence the, the room of a teenager, you know, like, so it really becomes part of, of a larger culture. But can you operate that, let's say, physically or like, like a as a living artist? Can you create that? Is that possible? So it's been a question all the time because I think the moment you cross the boundary, you enter into this other field. And suddenly, what I said to Colette, like things make sense or make no sense anymore. Uh, 
But of course, I'm talking, this was 20 years ago. So it has also changed a lot. So also with internet has changed. Uh, let's say the access to art through as information also becomes different. Uh, you know, like you don't longer need to go to an art museum to see art. You can see it online. You can see it in different ways. So I think also this has changed. Uh, so in, perhaps the art world has expanded in that sense. So the limits are maybe more blurred. Uh, also, it has become a question not only for me, but for many artists, like how we deal with reality, how we deal with the outside world. So it also, you know, becomes becomes a. But yeah, I I wouldn't know. I mean, I wouldn't know if I think it's liquid in the sense of it's changing. <laughs> you know, it's like it's not a castle anymore. It's not this kind of uh, let's say. Yeah, exclusive space that used to be where just the great masters could be. You know, is 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 big. That castle is being uh, de defied. Uh, like Arso is not anymore just a Euro Eurocentric castle or or a American European castle. You know, it has has been invaded by by artists from other places of the world. Uh, so yeah, it's expanding, it's changing. And, uh, but I think the interesting thing now is that, let's say, since we cannot travel so easily, since a lot has been canceled, postponed, put in doubt, we also start to refer more and more to our own local art world. But that doesn't mean we are going back to how it used to be before, but maybe in a different way, you know, maybe it's changing, maybe now, you know, like it, the, let's say local discussions also become very important. It's not just this international discussion. So in that sense, yeah, again, I think it's liquid, it's changing, you know? So I don't know if I can answer such a deep question. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for, your, for uh, talking with us about uh, your text and the uselessness, um, the happy uselessness of the artist. In German, it's actually, uh, how do you say, an exclusive or a uh, it's not a happy, it's just like a kind of extinguished uselessness of the art. Uh, thanks, thanks to the traductions, we can make nicer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit more kind of this kind of uselessness. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much. A small uh, hint to our um, Romanian institutions. Carlos would love to travel to Transylvania someday and do a project over there. He's been talking about this for like 10 years now and every time he comes to Europe, <laughs> He says, Transylvania. Right. Hopefully we will be able to travel soon. <laughs> Take care. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yes, Thank hope you. to see you soon here in Romania. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we will be back in 10 minutes. Yes. yes.